and action. Does everybody say they hate to hear their voice on? You're the first. Oh. I hate to hear my voice. <laughs> the, the internet just hates to look at me. <laughs> hey, you're very brave to put yourself out there. Why? Well, I mean, you know, you open yourself up. You're uh, in a pretty vulnerable situation when you invite the internet in, you know? I just don't give a fuck. Well, <laughs> some people can turn that off. <laughs> I don't think I've ever turned it on. <laughs> so funny. So I, don't, funny. I don't know that I've ever. Right there. So no, I could say you do care. You're one of those that say, yeah, ugh, shit, don't bother me. And then you go home and you're like, <laughs> certain shit bothers me. There's. Oh, for sure. Well, I mean, if anybody was attacking me on social media, I actually asked CJ that while I was talking to CJ about it. And I'm like, you know, I'm going on this thing and a couple of his videos have made it viral. And I don't think I could handle some negative comments about my, what I look like or the clothes I'm wearing. You know, they pick you apart. Well, it's funny. I mean, if anybody's anything bad to say about the Kardashians, I'm like, are you serious? Why? They're the heart. Well, the whole thing is like, what do they contribute to society? You know, like, why are they famous? What's the big deal? They're incredibly hardworking individuals. Are they? Oh, yeah. I watch the Kardashians. I mean, I, I'm a late, I'm a late fan. I've just recently started watching, so I'm watching the Hulu stuff. And um, it's unbelievable. It's 24-7. They are? Oh, yeah. With posting on Instagram, keeping up their... Keeping up with the Kardashians. That's their word. health, their diet, uh, their kids, their fashion. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, I'd be exhausted. I can't. I'm not. At some point, I have to turn it off. I'm like, okay, enough. You, know? you have to turn off the Kardashians? Or no, just no, like no. I, I have to turn myself off. You know, like my husband will be like, you're supposed to be home. That's when you get shit done. And I'm like... I'm clocked out for the day. I put my kids to bed. I'm watching <laughs> my show. <laughs> no, but whatever. No, I think they're hard working. I think they've earned everything that they have. Yeah. They put themselves out there. And they are. They look amazing. Yeah. Yeah, they've had surgery, but they look amazing. Sure. Yeah. So I admire them. <laughs> you admire them? Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know enough about them to speak Yeah. about it fully. Yeah. yeah. Like... I don't know. She's well, I don't either, but I think anybody that you know critiques um, celebrityism, I'm sure it's a very difficult world to be in. Um, so I tend not to cast stones. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? I mean, I would never think to write a negative comment or a hurtful, hateful thing to somebody. I would never think to do that because it's a human being, whether they're famous or not. It's <laughs> that's just how I feel about it. Well, it's, to me, it's. I only value the opinion as much as I value the person saying it. Okay. So I don't. Yeah, but if that were the case for just like the human psyche, they'd be able to filter that shit out. And a lot of them, they won't even read comments because they're so, I don't think we can imagine some of the comments, how ugly they are. And, sure. I, you know. Depends on what phase you are in. Like you referred to Joe Rogan earlier. Joe Rogan yeah. doesn't have to read the comments. No. Because Joe Rogan was famous before he ever did a podcast. Well, it's not even about being famous. It's just like, you know, this is probably coming from somebody who did nothing with themselves living in their basement. But still, it's like, oh, my God. Right. But my point is, is Joe Rogan doesn't have to read the comments because he doesn't have to build a fan base because he already built a fan base in a different way. Right. But when you're a celebrity, it's like in your face all the time. Yeah. Whether it's on the cover of a magazine or it's like the Aaron Carter thing is so tragic. But, but when you... When you have money, yeah, and you well, have what's money have to do with it? Is that real? You can't be famous really without money. Well, you they, they come together. Yeah. So when you have that money, doesn't make you like a hard person though. No, but what I'm saying is it puts you, you're, you're putting yourself in a position to be judged. Oh, so you think you're one of those? You think that they they deserve it? No, I don't think they deserve it. Oh. I just think that you have to understand that. If you're going to be in politics or if you're going to be in entertainment or if you're going to voice an opinion yeah. and be honest about your opinion, yeah. then you have to be prepared and ready for any sort of yeah. backlash that your opinion may have. I guess. 
I just know I'm right for me in my opinions. Yeah. Again, yeah. like right for me. Yeah. It may not be right for you, but it's right. right for me and it may be right for somebody else. Yeah. Right. So when I have an opinion or a thought on something, I share it. And if somebody else agrees, great. If they don't, also great. Yeah. I might learn something from it. I mm-hmm. might take that on and say, oh, okay, that's an interesting point of view. Or I might go, you're fucking stupid. That's <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> I don't even understand where you can. Yeah. You know, like there's there's plenty of topics in oh, the yeah. world that, in, I mean, you've known me long enough to know that yeah. I have opinions on all of them. Yeah, but you don't ever say like ugly things. Like ser- to engage conversation, you usually will post a funny thing like, Cocoa Puffs are better than Cocoa Pebbles. Dispute me. (laughs) Or whatever you say. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, okay. (laughs) It's also the the fact that, like, I I don't do things to necessarily be controversial as much as I do them to voice my opinion and and share my thoughts and hope that somebody else either shares the opinion and shares the thought or they – disagree in a way that they're going to engage in an actual conversation when i say i want my kid to decide what type of person she is yeah and then i get attacked for my weight it's just you're off topic you don't matter yeah once you're off topic you don't matter but still it's a hurtful thing to say like i'm not talking all sunshine and rainbows here i'm just saying like i mean it's again it's, it's only hurtful if i it's only hurtful if i thought i wasn't fat like i'm aware of my body in like I'm aware of my body. Like I'm a, I'm aware of the fact that I am a larger guy, but yeah. On camera in a chair, yeah. I'm definitely going to look larger and rounder than when true? I stand up. Is that true? They say up. the camera t- t- adds 10 pounds. The, it I don't know if it's 10 pounds necessarily, but definitely camera angles change the way you look. Right. And your clothes change the way you look. Right. And then you're also saying something that somebody disagrees with that might trigger something that's tra- traumatic for them. Yeah. So they're going to come back and attack. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, he made her play hurt? Well, he's fat. He probably doesn't even do anything. What a, He's probably eating tacos and yelling at her. Like, that doesn't even make any sense. But sure, yeah. okay. Yeah. It probably was eating tacos and yelling at her. Well, well let's so. just hope everybody out there is as nice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Again, I don't <laughs> care. I, I think it's funny when they say... Like, when they attack me, I think it's funny. I got bullied as a kid. and then You know, I, I've been listening to this podcast, and I've actually come to find out a lot about you that I didn't know. Obviously, you know, we talk, but I would have never thought you were bullied. Yeah, because I Cause you're Well, no, because you're a bigger guy. I wasn't I wouldn't then. have messed with you. Oh, well, you said you played football. I was still small. I weighed, my freshman year of high school, I weighed 130. Yeah. My senior year of high school, I wrestled at 160. Oh, and you were wrestling. So I weighed, at, I weighed about 170 mm-hmm. on average. Yeah. But then I would cut weight for wrestling. So yeah. I was – I worked out hard yeah. for a lot so of maybe, years. Yeah, maybe you are a, have a, a shell then. Yeah. Me, I, I was like, I don't know. I'm very th- – well, I don't want to say I'm thin-skinned. But, but then I also grew up with six adopted siblings. Right. Which – in the town that I grew up in made me mm-hmm. weird. Like I was a weirdo because I had six adopted siblings that lived out in the woods. Okay. So people made assumptions and people just said nonsense Yeah. about that. Yeah. And then I, I changed schools multiple times. Okay. So I changed from seventh grade into eighth grade. I changed from public school to a Catholic school because my parents thought that would be a good idea for their atheist son. <laughs> That didn't go well. Did you know you were atheist oh, then? Yeah. I knew I was atheist from like, oh. I don't know that I'm atheist as much as I'm agnostic. Which um, is what you don't believe in God. Atheist means that you object to the idea of a God. Agnostic is when you don't know what there is, but you're not really interested in doing the work to find out. You can touch back on that, but I have my own thing about religion as well. Yeah. So, so I went to a different, I went to a Catholic school my eighth grade year. Okay. And... I had no friends there. No. And then it was like they had been in school together since kindergarten, and now it's eighth grade, which is their last year. And then here I come in. Yeah. And everything every teacher says has a tone of religion to it, so obviously I question every single thing they say. Like, really? How's that work? Really? I don't understand that. Really? But then... You think this guy did this? Really? Yeah. <laughs> like, so, and I wasn't trying to be 
I wasn't trying to be controversial or mean to anybody. I was, I was legitimately just trying to understand how that could, like, how can you think that? Right. Like when people say certain things to me, I still do it today. Where I'm like, really? You know, I've said it to you. I'm like, really? You think that? Yeah. Like, how do you think that? Mm-hmm. <coughs> it's, a, I think, a genuine curiosity. Yeah. Right. So, which I don't think the kids necessarily bothered the kids as much, but I just don't think they liked me very much. Okay. And then I went to a different school out of town. Yeah. Freshman year. So then, and we, I mean, it was the 90s. So there wasn't, there wasn't any rules really at that point of right. wokeness or, yeah, there wasn't really school shootings, but there was a lot of violence. There yeah. was a lot of fighting in the hallways. There was oh, a lot I of fighting. Oh, I remember that in my high school, yeah. Yeah, there was, there was fighting all the time. Mm-hmm. So I embraced violence. Because I played football and I wrestled. Okay. So then I just... You got in fights. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots. And I, I mean, I got the shit kicked out of me a bunch of times. I can remember, you know, being in the stairwell, you know, through passing classes and seeing fights, you know, happen and being just, like, <laughs> traumatized. There'd be that group of people that would stand and watch and I'd be like, ah. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um, so The infamous Timberland boot fight between two girls in my school. Oh, God. Amazing. I mean, it's not like I was like seeking out fights in the hallways oh, yeah. and like fighting every week, but I definitely yeah. defended myself when I had to. And yeah. when I learned that people were intimidated by violence, I was like, oh, okay, I can use this. Yeah. And then I didn't have to be violent anymore. Yeah. Because people just. No, you just told me, well, that one go- kid, yeah. Yeah. And you're I, still friends with him. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's pretty great. Yeah. But it's. I don't condone violence. I don't think violence is the answer. No. It was the answer for me at that point in my life and at that time. Right. But it was only – and I didn't have to fight in the hallways because people knew that on the football field and on the wrestling mat, I was a savage. Like, I, yeah. was, I was throwing my whole body at people and hurting yeah. them for fun. But it just, like, makes me – like, the, the part of the story that you said when you were, like, you had that one friend and then – a group of people told them to not be your friend. Yeah. That like, made me so sad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, me too. But see how you come out of it. You know what I mean? I think that's what's happening. With I mean, I don't know if you want to touch too much on that whole subject of today in society. But it's, what do you mean? Well, it's just, you know, we're trying to protect our children so much. And I get that to a certain extent. But they have to be able to come out the other side stronger. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think I think Jordan Peterson says it best. Oh, my God. I love him. When I know that he's controversial and, like, some people love him and some people hate him. I like parts of him and I don't like other yeah. parts of him. Yeah. I take the pieces that I like and I let go of the pieces that I don't. Yep. Because that's how I think the world should work. Mm-hmm. But I think he says it best when he says children learn when you let them do dangerous things safely. Mm-hmm. And that's always how I raised my kid. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's sort of how I was raised. Right. Um, and I think when you don't do that and you don't allow your kids yeah. to learn their limits, especially when they're still rubbery when they're young, yeah, then they're not going to bounce back as much when they're older. Right. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard because it takes a village. Mm-hmm. And your town is your village. Your school is your village. And if, right. the, and if the village decides that – weakness and entitlement is the path yeah then you have to find a way to be on board with it partially Mm -hmm. and also navigate your own morals and values inside of it Mm -hmm. because that's the way a society works a society works best when you can look at it and go okay these are the pieces of society that we have to deal with because that's life Mm -hmm. and then these are the pieces of society that I can help you understand that they don't matter as much. Mm-hmm. And you get to have your own morals and values and decide what you're going to do in these particular circumstances. Yeah. So it's, I mean, life's hard. It's not, yeah. it's not easy. It's not mm-hmm. an easy thing. And if no. we don't start treating our children accordingly, yeah, then when life gets hard, they're not going to know gonna, what to do. They're going to implode. They're, they are. They're going to implode, and then they're going to 
they're going to hurt themselves or they're going to hurt others or they're going to do both. I think coping skills too have a lot to do with it. Young people today, they don't know how to cope with, you know, well, certain it's situations. Well, like what, what kind of situation? Give me an example. Coping, um, you know, um, a bad day at work or, yeah. you know, a bad day. Well, I, don't, I don't know. I just don't. I just feel like a lot of these issues that are coming up today weren't issues back in the 90s when I was still in school. And has it changed that much? Are people, are kids that different? I don't know. I know that social media plays a huge role because that's 24-7 in your kid's face. So if they are being cyber bullied or bullied at school, it's, it could be a 24-hour thing. Well, that's where I don't think your kids belong on social media No, I don't either. Time. And I'm not, like... I don't either. I know kids are going to – my kid sneaks. My kid sneaks and, and, right. and creates secret accounts, and then I have to find them, and then I have to figure out how I'm going to deal with that, and then I have to sometimes yeah. deal with it effectively, and sometimes I deal with it ineffectively. Yeah. It's – you know, and it, God bless my kid. Ironic statement, but, but God bless my kid. She's such a, she's a sweetheart, but I also have bipolar. So when my feelings get hurt, yeah. I jump to anger. Yeah. Right? I would never hurt her. I never have. No. But I still get angry and I get loud and I'm big. Yeah. Like I'm a big presence. Mm -hmm. And not, and that's the, and that's going back to like people saying, oh, look, this 400 pound guy. Like you don't realize until I stand up that I'm very broad. Like I have wide shoulders. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a husky, sturdy dude. <laughs> yeah. Like there's not a lot of people that are going to move me. So it's, it's got to be intimidating for a 14-year-old to piss me off. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, she avoids that at all costs. Yeah. But like I said, I, I, would, I don't think violence is the answer, and I'm never violent with her. No. But, it's, but that doesn't mean that I don't lose my temper. Yeah. doesn't mean that I don't scream and yell and throw tantrums, because I do. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, you know. Yeah, right. I know. Well, that's good. And that's part of who I am. Mm-hmm. And I'm working on it constantly, and I throw way less tantrums than I used to. Yeah. Just in general. But I get triggered. Sure. And and it's not an excuse, but anybody that understands bipolar understands that, like, it's uncontrollable in moments. It's a, ooh, it's, it's like a, a Yeah, but it's, yeah. it spikes. Interesting. Like, it, when you get triggered, it's instantaneous rage. There's no buildup. Like, you don't work yourself up to a rage. It's like... It just fucking switches. Okay. And then it... it Sadness, too. Yep. And happy. And happy. Sounds exhausting. It's exhausting. <laughs> Until you learn how to, you know, manage it. And I... Well, I that's, do it too. Uh, that's it, too. That's it. Yeah, that's it, too. I think um, self-awareness is important. I've struggled with anxiety and depression for a long time as well. Yep. And it's never really been like a crutch or something that I've used as a... Well, I can't because my anxiety, you know, yeah. I have to learn to function. I have to make a living. I have to go to work every day. I have to raise my kids. Let's figure it out. And I find my most peace when I'm at work or with, you know, but those are working my brain. I <laughs> imagine those are life lessons that you learned as a kid. Well, that's what I mean. Coping. Yeah. Right. Like those are those are what our kids. Some of our kids are missing out on mm -hmm. is those lessons like, you know, the video where everybody's well, you're fat. You shouldn't tell her to win. She shouldn't play through hurt. It's like, well, playing through hurt is how you get through life. I yeah. play through hurt every day. What's wrong with wanting to win? Right. Or what's wrong with losing? Nothing's so what? Wrong. You're going to lose. I mean, <laughs> it's more fun to win. Sure. That's how I explain it to my sure. kid is it's more fun to win. Like, yeah. It doesn't matter if you win or lose, I, I guess. But that's the goal. If we're though. playing for fun, it's way more fucking fun to win. Yeah. Life is more fun than you win. Yeah. I'm winning. Like, I am winning at life. You're yeah. winning at life. We both have very successful businesses that we enjoy most of the time. Yeah. But the idea of, like, oh, if you find a job that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Bullshit. <laughs> like, every day is work. Every, I love what I do, what but I mean. every day is work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still managing people. Yeah. I'm managing clients. I'm managing sure. systems. Employees. and Yeah. Like yeah it's oh, just people. <laughs> Oh, people. Right. Oh, there are people. I forgot. No. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's that kind of thing where it's like, if you find a job and you're an employee, maybe you never 
truly work a full day in your life, I guess, if yeah. you truly love your job. Yeah. But even jobs that I really enjoyed, when I waited tables, I loved it. Yeah. But it was still work. Yeah. I still had to deal with people. Well, even before, like, I owned my business, I, I always, I mean, I've been in the grooming industry for 25 years. So my first job was when I was 16 as a dog bather. And I distinctly remember my first day, a big hairy dog shaking soapy water all over me and being like, oh, dogs shake when they're wet. <laughs> and I'd be soaked at 8.30 in the morning and I'd have to continue for the rest of the day. My shoes would be, you know, with the yeah. water. But I loved going to work, yeah. you know? And it just like, I don't know. You, I guess, you know, I enjoyed it even though before I owned my own place. I, I always enjoyed what I did. But it was s still work and it was like, right. how do you perfect your craft and that whole thing. Well, that's the thing that I think. I think if you stay stagnant. I think a lot of people miss good. out on the understanding of how do you get better at something. You keep Most trying. people are like, I'm good enough. This is good enough. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> oh, I have this job. I make this much money. Yeah. I'm, this is good enough. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. You, you, you can live your life at good enough. And yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, but then I don't want to hear you complain then. Which they will. Or like complain about other people or comment on other people you right. know like um, stop no, you have the opportunity to do it go do it right nobody tell you stay here <laughs> like yeah it's exactly that it's the idea of you don't build anything worth having without effort mm -hmm. so you have to put the effort in and it doesn't happen overnight you know i think a lot of this social media instagram sensation youtube whatever but even that doesn't happen overnight. No, that's no, the well other that, thing that that's people what don't I'm realize. saying. So many people are like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I've seen so many young people say, a YouTuber. Which is fine. That's a thing to be now. But you it can, takes effort, but though. It, a lot of fucking effort. Yeah. And it, it takes, takes a lot long, of time. Long days, long hours. Content. Lots of skills. Posting. Lots of skills. Good equipment. Mm -hmm. You have to know what you're doing. So it's like, even if you want to do that, it's not like just doing a hula hoop trick in your bedroom and you're going to be a viral sensation or Right. That's just how I feel. Right. Things there are those small percentages of people that, you know, do make it. Right. But it's it's no different than any other entertainment field. Mm -hmm. You're, there's more opportunity for people to be their own creator, which oh. is nice. But there are still gatekeepers to the entertainment industry now. There, there are gatekeepers to YouTube. There are gatekeepers to social media. Yeah. And even... I mean, even just look at like this podcast with TikTok, YouTube, yeah. and I'm Instagram. Not on TikTok anymore. But TikTok's where I'm going the most viral. TikTok is where I'm getting the most attention because the algorithm is better there. It has the best algorithm for people to find you. Okay. Whereas Instagram's algorithm is it's hard. It's it's a hard. It's algorithm hard to get and likes and stuff. Well, because they're they use a paid to play model. Yeah. You know, if you the more you boost your post and the more you pay for your post, the more likely it will be to be seen. OK. And then you have to have other people sharing it and liking it and being involved with it as much as possible. Yeah. So. It becomes really difficult at a certain point. Mm -hmm. If all you want to do is be famous on the Internet, you have to realize that that takes five to ten years to build that. Mm hmm. You can build a decent following in 18 months to 24 months. Right. But it takes years to become famous. Yeah. Just like it always has. Mm -hmm. Nothing is an overnight success. Mm -mm. Right? So we had, you know, we had Rodney on, who I love. He's fantastic. Yeah. But he's been doing stand-up for decades. Yeah. 20 years before he made it. Wow. Rodney Dangerfield was 50. Yeah. Did you know that? Before he made it big time, he was yeah. 50 years old. Yeah, he, he was. But that's uh, true to your, your, if you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give up. Yeah, right. just keep going. Just keep, keep It's easier on. to just keep going. Right. Than and to it, start over. But it doesn't. Like, I've done a lot of things with my life that I don't think a lot of people realize that I've done. Mm -hmm. And I've done them all successfully. Yeah. To the point that I wanted to do them when I said, okay, I got here. It's not what I thought it would be. Yeah. Or, okay, I got to this level. 
it's going to take this much more effort and this much more sacrifice mm. to get to this level. Mm -hmm. That's the key word. Sacrifice. Do, do I want to sacrifice what it's going to take to get to the next level? Yeah. Right? It's do I want to sacrifice what, it, what I have to sacrifice to have abs? I do not. I do not want to sacrifice those things right now in my life. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. I'm not interested in eating chicken and broccoli only for six months to get abs. Like, I'm not in that. Like, that means I have to give up. Oh, abs. Abs. I thought you said apps. No, abs. Oh, yeah. Like a six pack. We could get one of those ab rollers. <laughs> sure. Yeah, but you still have to diet. <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> I don't even know his name. Body by Jake. My mother bought one. You need, a, sh you need one. a shake weight. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, there's, but no matter what, you it's, there is sacrifice in every accomplishment. Sure. And if you're not willing to sacrifice those things, then you're never going to make it. Yep. So I've gotten to positions in my life where I would look at my life and go, oh, I have to give up all of this to keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm done with that thing. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give this stuff up. There are those people, though. Yeah, and that's great. And I loved, you know, when you said you've become, well, the reason for starting this whole podcast was the, uh, you've just been intrigued and fascinated with achievement. achievement. And mm -hmm. I am right there with you. Like, you have that one percent of people that just are a different mind yeah and they're just a machine mm -hmm. and they sacrifice and do whatever and they got to do to do it yeah. i sacrificed all of my 20s huh. to learn how to do what i do today yeah. i sacrificed all of my 20s and all of my relationships before my wife to do what i do yep and then i built something that was suitable for my kid and my wife to stay in my life yeah because I sacrificed everything to have them. Mm -hmm. And then I found balance. And I went, okay, I can do this version of this. And I can make this super successful. Mm -hmm. Because I know how I work and how I operate. Yeah. So I know I can build this thing with my skill set. And I can still go to my kids' softball games. And I can still love my wife at night. Yeah. And that's what matters to me. Mm -hmm. Right? And then, you know, you trickle other things in. And you add other things in that start to matter to you yeah you know my health does matter to me contrary to popular belief um so i do go to the gym i do have a trainer i do work out yeah but i'm in pain from all the violence that i endured oh, yeah the self i bet yeah self <laughs> like did it to myself yeah but i played football for 11 years oh, yeah. i wrestled for four years i did jujitsu yep. and then i did a little bit of stunt work and then i was a clown and then i did more stunt work and then yeah. You know, and yeah. then I got old, and now this is where I'm at. We're old. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm older than my 20s. Right. You know, I'm 43, so I'm still young, so I have a lot of time. Yeah. And I'll have more time the, the, the more I am conscious of what I'm putting into my body, but I also have other health issues. Like, I have a blood disorder that causes blood clotting that I just have to deal with. There's no yeah. cure for it. I just have to take these meds, and those meds make me tired, and those meds Ugh. make me sluggish, and they make me, you know. They make it so, and I have to take them. So you have to find the it's ways to do It's easier said than that. done. Ugh, I hate that phrase. You do. <laughs> I hate that phrase. Well, I mean, it's, but I mean, I, you know, I was just at the doctor recently. She's like, how about exercise? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's right there with all the other questions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm on my feet, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah. I don't want to do any of that. Yeah. And then I have two kids, so. Right, you wrestle. I mean, you do movement with your kids. Anyways. My job is physical, yeah. yeah. But I can start, you know, to see or feel. Yeah. Oh, that's, you know, that hurts. Oh, that hurts. Well, I think also I didn't have – I couldn't afford to go to the gym in my 20s because yeah. I lived in New York and L.A. and it was expensive. But I was also waiting tables. So yeah. I was always picking stuff up and carrying it around. And sure. I was always, like, stacks of plates and cups and waters. And then I was walking 8 to 15 miles a night yeah in circles yeah but i was still walking them i know you know you're doing twenty thousand steps in one shift as a server sometimes yeah I bet. so you're doing all this stuff that's not like a cubicle or right anything. it's yeah. so you're moving yeah. right whereas now my life is not subjective to moving as much mm -hmm. so i have to like demand it of myself mm -hmm. um but it's fine it's part of life right it's all good but achievement is one of those things that 
there's a system to it and everybody follows the same pattern that is successful Mm -hmm. it's it's their own sort of variation on it but it i mean i can break it down whenever i meet somebody and see what they've done and see how long it took them but you didn't you didn't open a dog salon no well i did when you were 22 years old no actually this is what i'm doing no yeah i'm it took you i just i remember being you know in my 20s teen late teens early 20s and people would ask me when you can do your own thing steph when are you going to open? And I wanted really nothing to do with it. I was like, no, I'm good with just going to work. I saw what my manager at the time had to deal with. And I was just like, no, I'll just groom my dogs and go home. And that was fine for a while. It actually wasn't until I worked in a corporate level as a manager that I was like, I could do this. So how long were you grooming oh before you opened Rough and Tumble? Um, so I opened Rough and Tumble in 2019. Um, but like I said, I've been in the grooming industry for 25 years. So I don't know at that time, 20, so 20 years. Oh yeah. Over 20, 20 years. Right. So, and then you opened a salon that you yeah. had a vision for, which is very unique and very different yeah. than anyone else Yep. that I've ever seen. <laughs> well, my goal for it was to, because prior to in my grooming career i had worked for a handful of salons you know Mm -hmm. five or so and didn't really work in any that looked like i had envisioned in my mind right and um i was actually kind of inspired by your wife who's a very good friend of mine (laughs) uh she had a hair salon for people she did you know still does people hair for a living and i just thought you know what about having a salon you know for dogs that had the aesthetics of you know, walking into a person salon. Yeah. And so when I built it, that was my goal was obviously to make it really nice. And some people will use the word bougie. Um, but I wanted it to be an open concept so people can, could be invited to the process of dog grooming and nothing was hidden from closed, closed view. You can see the bathing going on. You can see the drying going on. And then all the hair cutting is done out in the big front room. Um, so that was important to me. So, um, but it took, it was a journey, you know, it, it was, yeah. Well. I, think, I think it's funny when people think bougie is a bad thing. Well, bougie to me just means clean and better quality. Right. It was, it's so a upper, a level up. So better. <laughs> like that's, that's I what guess that means. So. That means better. Yeah. Well, I think I, you know, I've in the past 10 to 15 years, there's been a shift in the grooming industry period yeah. with social media. And I mean, when I started grooming, I would say it wasn't as popular. You know, it was like, you know, there was that group of people that did it. And you'd go to these trade shows and there'd be a handful of vendors and you'd see people walking around and a small contest ring for dogs. And now you go to these expos and it's like, I went to the biggest one in the United States is in Pennsylvania, Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I was, I had a panic attack. And that's no joke of how many people were there. It was mobbed. Mobbed. Yeah. The competition ring was full. It's crazy what the internet has done. Yeah. But it's just, it's leveling up with equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, Just, you know, people's, just their look, their skill set, their establishments. It's, and so it was like, that's what I want to be a part of it's quality it's, matters it's changing it's changing and i want to be a part of it yeah can you do it in your basement you can can you but as long as you have a small operation on the side shit. you can yeah but, but that's really not what i was quality matters quality matters quality is the only way to find more success and more money sure you you cannot oh there's an intense amount of effort that I put into because like, I, when I started, I opened, it was just myself. And then in January of 2020, I took on my first employee, which is Lindsay, who's been such a huge part of the success of yep. Rough and Tumble. And, um, she, uh, it, you know, she definitely added to the whole vision of Rough and Tumble. And I, now I have 10 employees. So, I take a lot of time in training everybody and keeping that consistency, you know, amongst the group 
we have a standard they know what that is because it needs to be consistent every time that customer comes in that dog has to go out how it came the first time well there's two ways to make a lot of money you can either do it in quality or quantity but you can't have both yes you can't have both mm -hmm. you're either going to have a high quantity of something that's shit <laughs> that people will pay for yeah the least amount they pay for yeah. but a lot of people will pay for it yeah like if you're going to groom 500 dogs a day mm -hmm. at ten dollars a piece right or you can do 10 dogs yeah. at 500 dollars a piece yeah not that you charge that but right the, but no that's i the find point. that my prices are pretty reasonable yeah you know, or they're fair they're fair for what we what for we, what you're doing and what you offer and the quality of it sure. and sure. the assurance that you're that the dog like as a dog owner when you're dropping your dog off yeah. making sure that your dog is safe yeah I mean, I never liked the, well, I don't know what you would call it, not comparison, but when you put dogs and money in the same category, I just, it's like a gross feeling because I feel like I if know. you start pushing how, you know, more dogs, more dogs, more dogs, that's when shit goes awry and pe dogs can get hurt and then your groomers get burnt out and then they don't want to do this anymore. And so it was like, we need to find a level of dogs that we can do comfortably, safely, quality and we meet all those every day well that's why daycares have rules on how many kids can be with yeah. number of teachers yeah it's kind of similar with dogs like it's if, important if they're you, living things living beings they're not shrubs right <laughs> it's not it's not like you know it's like i gotta care for each one of those dogs i have to keep an eye on each one of those dogs and it can't be an assembly line cook you know cookie cutter yeah no i'm they know, all have individual needs I'm an animal lover, so no. But so, so, so that was part of my vision was yeah. that as well because I've worked for places where it was like more, 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 and it's like right. this is un this reaching an unhealthy, uncomfortable level. Yeah, and it's making me uneasy. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? But one of my greatest accomplishments, I would say, <clears throat> which was what kind of sparked my whole thing of I could do this on my own, was I was working for a corporate salon as a manager, and I took that salon that was off the radar at the time and I took it to the top 10 in the nation out of 3,600 stores we were number seven look at you go so I, at that time I realized I can drive a team I can do this and it has a lot to do with did you play sports as a kid nope what did you do as a kid you know grooming is the only thing I stuck with I played soccer I played the saxophone I <laughs> tried ice skating, but I didn't stick with anything. I never stuck with anything. I was kind of a nervous kid and stuff, but grooming so was the one thing that I stuck with. What do you contribute that stick to itness? If um, well, I went to college for for you know semester and realized it wasn't for me. One whole semester. Well, hey, look at you knocking it out of the park. You know what I mean? But it was actually I just wanted to play soccer. I wasn't even that good. So you played soccer in high school? No. No, you just wanted no, to, go I to just, college? No, I just joined that team. I guess it was open enrollment maybe. I don't know. And so I had to maintain a certain grade average, and it just wasn't happening. And I was like, okay, this isn't really working out. This isn't for me. I didn't really know what my direction was going to be. Yeah. And I fell into grooming, and I thought, you know, I was like, okay, well, school's not going to work out. I need to figure out how to make a living not having a college education. And so I wanted to be the best I could be at grooming. And there were a lot of people along the way that inspired me to continue my learning and go to trade shows. And then I became involved in competitive grooming. And there's a whole world with that. And Did you always like dogs? Oh, yeah. We always had dogs in my family. Always been animal lovers. But it wasn't like one of those things that, like, I know what I want to be when I grow up. It just kind of, like I said, it was one of my first jobs when I was 16. I was introduced to it with two of my friends. And one of those friends was a groomer. And she was like, Joanne. <laughs> she was such an inspiration to me. She was so good at it. And she put out such an awesome. I'm talking past the mic. Sorry. She was so good at it. And she was, um, she, she made dogs look great. And I was like, I want to be like that. Yeah. I want to do what she does. She was just a cool all-around chick. She had pet snakes and pit bulls. And <laughs> I just want to be like Joanne. 
Um, and so she really kind of, yeah, inspired me to get good at it. So did your parents work? Did they have their own business? Oh, I, mean, yeah. I know they worked, but did they have Yeah, like, my mother always had her career. She was a respiratory therapist. My father worked all his life. He's now retired, but now he works with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, and I think, um, you know, my mother really never said it out loud, but, you know, my parents divorced when I was about 13, 14 years old, and she never verbalized it, but she, you know, every day she'd go to work. And she did what she had to do to take care of me and my brother and put a roof over our head. And so I think it was like, you know, always make your own money, have a career. So if the rug gets pulled out from under you, you can still make it. You can still survive. Well, what I think is really interesting and, and cool about your story is that you wouldn't really think, oh, I can be a dog groomer and make a, like a full living. Yeah. You think of that as like, oh, that's their their part time job. Yeah. Or you think of it as like, oh, that's that's a kid's job. Yeah. Or it's a it's a job that you do until you get yeah. a real job. Yeah. Quote unquote. Yeah. Right. It's one of those things where every service yep. you can make a successful business out of if you have better quality service yeah. than everybody else around you. Yeah. And you can build a really nice life around that. Yeah, I think that's still coming into the public view, I guess you would say. And Burden Media has allowed me to showcase that, that it's, it's an extremely skilled, uh, you know, service to offer. You know what I mean? It's, it's just well, like any, anything else. You, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to get good at it. You can't just do it. I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, I tried to give a haircut myself. Can you fix this? Because it's just not... It's not as easy as you would think. It requires a lot of patience. I mean, just to scissor a dog, three years, your scissor skills are where they should be. And then that's not even counting about knowing all the breed specific patterns and haircuts they have. And, you know. Are you kidding me? Anybody that's ever owned a dog, try clipping their nails. Yeah, right. Like that's I've seen every trick in the book. Fucking... Putting peanut butter on the wall. My husband has to bear hug him. I have to pin him down. You know, it's a lot to learn dog behavior yeah. and how to work with an animal. So, you know, it's just, it, I, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's a hard job to do for sure. It is a hard it's job. It's not easy, yeah. But the point is, is most jobs are not necessarily easy. Right. It's about doing something that you enjoy doing mm -hmm. at a higher quality level than the next guy. Yeah. And you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about not having to walk into fucking PetSmart mm -hmm. to the back mm. and drop your dog off. Well, for some people, that's that, fine. Sh no. Well, no. I wouldn't drop my kid off like that. I wouldn't drop my dog off <laughs> like that. Well, for some people, it's okay. It's just the what you're going to run into is, you know, a lot of those people are fairly new in their yeah. grooming journey. And so when something happens... They're new. Or like somebody in a strip mall that has their salon and you find out that they fucking killed three dogs yeah. and they're still allowed to be open. Well, I don't it's know how that It's insane to me that they just hang a dryer on the kennel oh, yeah. and kill a fucking dog and then it's like, that's yeah. eh, fine. Yeah. You can keep taking dogs. Yeah, those stories, no when they when stories like that hit, you know, the the media and it just is a frenzy, it's, it's heartbreaking to me because I always feel like that was preventable. Why did nobody see this? Why did nobody say something? At some point, a dog will struggle, and it's not worth it. No. Nope. I legitimately don't know what I would do if somebody killed my dog. Like, if I drop my dog off to you, and I come back, and you're like, ooh, by the way. Yeah. Well, that would never happen like that. No, I know <laughs> for you, it would never happen. No. But it's happened. No, it has happened. But And so I do have an age restriction policy for my salon it's 12 years old for larger dogs 14 for small and you kind of wouldn't believe the amount of pushback i get from that from the from the owner and that's it's clearly out of safety you know i'm not medically trained heaven forbid phoebe has a seizure here or goes into cardiac arrest where am i 
going to go. I don't have a vet here. Yeah, that's and that happens because there are underlying illnesses with older pets that people aren't aware of. And they say, oh, she's fine at home. She's fine at home. But it may not be that way here. So I need you right. to understand I'm trying to keep my salon, my reputation, everything safe and your dog safe. Please respect that. The, you know, and so yeah. if it's a dog, I mean, I'm still grooming dogs. I groomed when I first started. They're 17 and 18 years old. I will see them through till they're no longer here. But new dogs, I won't acquire older pets. Right. But again, that speaks to quality. Because it's a liability. Yeah. It speaks to quality. But people get upset. But I'm, and I'm not, I didn't make the rule to I'm make you upset. I'm referring to, to stories that I hear of young dogs that are just, oh, like they literally hang a dryer on oh. a metal kennel yeah, for, for hours. And dogs. fucking yeah. kill a dog. Yeah. And then they're still allowed to well, be open. Well, that's what I mean. Nobody's watching. You right, know that's what I mean? not There's, okay. There are signs before that happen, and no, it, nobody's watching. Right, I mean, but I just, walk into your spot. And you can see. And I can see, one, I can see everything that's going on. Yeah. And two, I don't have this weird feeling of like, mm, should I leave my dog here? Yeah. Is my dog going to be safe here? That's really, that's part of, that's a big reason for open concept. It was because a lot of people, I wanted to showcase the process. Like, yes, all our dogs are hand blow dried. You can see them in this window to the left. Yeah. I don't do kennel drying. So it may require that they're with us for a longer period of time, but I'm not putting them in a hot box. I'm not doing it. Yeah, it's weird. Like, it's... I, well, that's I just, an old school thing. But it's a lot of salons still do it. And there, there are, um, you know, diffused air dryers that don't use heat. But still, dogs that are brachiophallic, that's what that's called. It's uh, like pugs and bulldogs and stuff. They can't handle air like that. Right. And so I just don't do it. It's just not, I don't know. Again, it goes back to quality. Yeah. There's two ways to make money, quantity or quality. Yeah. And in quantity, shit's going to get damaged. So if you love the thing that you're dropping off, yeah. like your dog, go for quality. Yeah. You're going to pay a little more, yeah. but it's worth it. Yeah. And that's the thing about dog owners, too, is they're all different. Sure. Some people don't. Yeah. Some people have dogs that they don't care. And yeah. then there's some people that have dogs that care too much. Yeah. And then there's the middle ground yes. of dog owners that are like okay yeah. this is reasonable and rational and this is what we have to do and that's another wonderful thing you learn when you're a dog groomer is how to read people yeah because you can kind of already be like oh, okay this one we're just gonna keep an eye on this one because <laughs> every little thing is gonna you know you could set that owner off or something and it's it's a good thing i'm i'm pretty good at reading people and situations you can tell the type of person somebody is by the way their dog behaves most of the time. Absolutely. You can tell what they care about. You can tell what they don't care about. Yeah. You can tell. And, like, I don't have perfect dogs. My yeah. dogs are a mess. But or you can tell how they behave with mom versus dad. Right. <laughs> I think people raise their dogs the way they raise their kids. Well, that can be uh, – that also is not good because canines are not children. No, but I, what I mean is I think that the behaviors mm -hmm. that... Oh, gets pushed on the dog. Yeah, the behaviors yeah. that get pushed on the dog also get pushed on the kids. Well, energy plays a huge role. Right. Because they're In not... kids and dogs. Oh, uh, yeah. It's like, you know, oh, I'm so, so nervous. Like, oh, is she going to be okay here? Wow, there's a lot of dogs. She can't be... Ever and you just see that dog like, what, mom? <laughs> What's there to worry about, mom? <laughs> like... <laughs> Are we going to be okay? I, I know, yeah. yeah. And it's like, nope, I just need you to step out. Yeah. And she'll come with me. And they do. They normally will. And so that's why I'm the alpha in my salon. There has to be an alpha. And if your dog doesn't have that in the household, you're going to have some problems. I think your kids need an alpha, too. Sure. And that can be mom or dad or a combination of the both. Yeah. But they, they, need, they need to know that there's somebody in charge. Sure. They need somebody who knows... They got their shit together. <laughs> right. Because there's that... Per like, that, those people in, in your dog or your kids' lives... Both of those beings look to those people to yeah. go, is this safe? Mm -hmm. Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Can I do this? And if you are not the person that they can look to, yeah, then they're just going to make decisions themselves and go, fuck it, this is what I'm going to do. Well, and because you can't vocalize or verbalize that to a dog, you have to be stoic. Mm -hmm. You have to be confident. You have to be like, you're okay. You're going to make it through. And you you're have to do be that okay. with your kids. I don't like it when... Dog owners come in. It's usually with the little dogs, and they have the dogs on their shoulder. 
and the dog's trembling like that. <laughs> and you're like, put that dog down because nobody in here is going to put that dog on their shoulder. Yeah. So they have to learn that it's okay to be on the ground. And there's, there's um, a pecking order and I'm in charge. And when I'm not here, one of my managers is in charge and they're going to be okay. Yeah. They're going to learn to cohabitate. I, it's doing your animal a disservice when you baby it. It's doing your kid a disservice when you baby it. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. People, like, I can tell before people have kids, if they yeah. have a dog, yeah. if they should have kids or not. Yeah. I'm like, oh, that's not going to go well. <laughs> that's going to be a mess. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. that, your dog's fucked and your kid's going to be just as yeah. fucked. Yeah, but you can't, like, you know, you wouldn't tell somebody that. I would. And you wouldn't tell that. Well, maybe you How would. How long have you known me? <clears throat> maybe you would, but. And you, and you can't tell a customer that either because it's coming from they love their dog and they want the best for their dog. Sure, and but you can say it in a way that educates them. You, you like, can. Like, hey, your dog likes the ground <laughs> if you well, let Well, actually, it. recently I had a dog come in and he had bites on his face. And I said, I'm noticing a little, oh, my other dog at home. You know, they got into it and they, he, he bit him. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, it's an unneutered male, intact male. And so when she came to pick him up, I said he was a little sensitive around his face. I'm assuming maybe it was just because he has some wounds, you know, on his nose and near his eye. She's like, I know. I can't believe that happened. You know, it's my other dog. He's like 10 years old. I'm like, is it a female? She's like, no, it's a male. I'm like, is it intact? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, that's why. <laughs> like, yeah. And you could tell this lady didn't have a dominant personality. So, and the dog that got bit, he... If he's not watched, he's invasive. And yeah. he probably tried to mount the other one. And that's how that happens. Fuck around and, and find hey. out. Hey. Fuck you know, around so it's like and find you out. You got to be smart. You know what I mean? They're animals. Yeah. So are They're kids. very smart and they can, they will figure it out. So are children. <laughs> they are, but. Yeah. I, I just do it. I compare. I I've guess always I, compared kids to dogs. I guess so. But because you can control so much of children. I mean, not so much of... Ch children can have outside influences from everywhere. So can dogs. Internet... No. They're oh, all you mean they're allowed to? Like well, it's good for them? Well, children have the internet, television, yeah. music, movies, video games. Their diet is like... Yeah, could be friends, family, whatever. They shouldn't A have A dog is only subjected to what you... You... Put in front of it. Your child is only subjected to not what you... No. So they got school, What you allow... Yeah, but they got. Yeah, but, at a certain but you point, just said your your daughter sneaks around and makes right. secret things. Of course, so she can be influenced without you even knowing. No, right. absolutely, uh, that but can't it, happen with a but dog. But I find out. Yeah. Because I'm in charge. Right, but that can't happen with a dog. A dog is only subjected to what you allow it to be subjected to. If my dog gets out, or if I ask somebody to watch my dog, yeah. or if somebody like. But that's not every day. No, it's not every day. No. And, and but for the first five years of childhood is where most of the development happens. Mm -hmm. The first two years are the most important development years of a human being's life. Mm -hmm. So it's not an excuse, but it is a reason. Yeah. So like my daughter for the first two years of her life was not treated like a human being. Mm -hmm. That's why I needed to adopt her. Yeah. Yeah. You know she was she was not treated like a human she was not treated well she was not loved she was not taken yeah. care of she was not safe so those two years are so vital in human development yeah just like the first two years of a dog but a dog the you first can two years it, of a dog is so vital you can reverse it with people too it just takes a lot more work a lot more time yeah <laughs> well and because you spend the time the, it takes the same amount of effort yeah. it just with a dog they they don't have the capacity to hold on to the trauma as much. Yeah. So they will hold on to the trauma and they can be triggered again, but you have to put them in a safe environment, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. don't give a certain aggressive dog to a certain family. No. That's not going to be willing to do the work. Right. You can't train your dog to be a, a weapon, right? You can't train your dog to be a weapon and then not maintain the work to make sure it's a safe weapon. Right. You can't be like, oh, yeah. I have this weapon. Let's take the safety off and just leave it in the living room yeah. and hope the toddlers don't touch it. Yeah. Like, that's not yeah. okay. Right, see what you're saying. Right, so it's the same concept with your kids. Those first two years in your kid's life and mm -hmm. in your dog's life are the most vital year. Like, Greg is a great dog. Yeah. But COVID happened. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm, yeah, but he's even out of the three, though, the best one. Right, but COVID happened in the middle of me training him. He's still... And then fine. Karen came in. Yeah. Which is my other dog. Yeah. At the same time that COVID interrupted Greg's socialization and training. Yeah. And then I had to deal with Karen on top of it because she was added mm-hmm. to the mix. So now well, you I had have a pit bull long before those two, and she was. Oh, Hannah! Hannah was best. great. Yeah. Hannah was the best. Yeah. You can't. It, but again, I treated her with a lot of love and a lot of discipline. Yeah, but also it was a lot of discipline, right? There was a lot of discipline. Like I've never had to leash my dog, and it wasn't never me either. None of them. Greg doesn't need to be leashed. Yeah. But it's I don't do, I don't do violence. Mm-mm. No, it didn't take it, that. It doesn't take that. No. Like you don't have to beat your dog to like Mm-mm. if you want to smack your dog on the ass, fine. You want to smack your dog on the nose, fine. It happens. Yeah. You smack your kid too. It is what it is. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people just need to be slapped. Yeah. It's not I don't know. Hitting I don't dogs think it's not really. It's not the They don't re- they don't understand what you're doing. They don't one. understand what they're doing. There are ways to physically there correct are a dog. Physical corrections that you can do to your dog. That a dog would understand. But they have to be in the moment. They do. And with your kids when they're two, they also have to be in the moment. Yeah. You can't look at your two-year-old and try and explain to them why 20 minutes ago they did something wrong. Right. Same with your dog. Yeah. Right? This is my yeah. correlation with dogs and, and yeah. kids. Yeah. Is that if you're not good at raising your dog until it's too incapable, yeah. then you should probably question if you're going to be able to raise your kids until they're too incapable of doing other shit. I get, there was a stand-up comedian that did a skit about uh, dogs and kids. And I used to think the same thing. Until I had kids. And I'm like, eh, they're not the same. <laughs> I don't feel like they're... They're, they're not they're identical. Simula- they're similarities. They're similarities. They're similar. I don't think yeah. they're identical. Yeah, like, they're I would, similarities. I, don't, I would never put my kid on a leash. Yeah. No. But I don't usually put my dog on a leash either unless I'm yeah. going somewhere public where it's required. Yeah. And then he just wears it because he's supposed to. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm respectful of the rules. Yeah. Like, I'm not that guy that's going to be like... But Greg's funny. Like he, like I'll take him off leash and he'll stay at my hip. Well, you can always tell, yeah. But you can always tell dogs that are, um, you know, they get out of the house a lot. They're used to their routine because routine is so important as it is with children. Right. You know, the way to help your dog's anxiety and stress is to keep doing something they don't like over and over again. So if you only bring them in the car to go to the groomer and the vet, they're going to hate going in the car. Right. Drive him around, Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. Go to the grocery store. Leave him in there, like the car, if it's not summertime. <laughs> right. You know, for a little while while you're in there for 20 minutes. My dog Gilligan used to come everywhere with me. He used to sit in the passenger seat. People would get a kick out of that, but he yeah. would, yeah, and he, you know. But it, for me, it's they're not identical, but there are a lot of similarities in raising mm-hmm. toddlers and dogs. Sure. Toddlers, sure. Not teenagers. And some people toddlers. are good at it, and some people are yeah. Not so like good. some people are good at it, and some and some people don't see the correlation, and some people yeah. do. But the reality for me is, when you can see correlations in life mm-hmm. to certain things, yeah, that's how you become more successful at those things. Yeah. When you can see, well, I don't have to, to be a dog groomer to run a successful dog grooming salon or business. I have okay. I have to run a business successfully. I hire the right people to do the job, mm-hmm. right? Like I would never be the groomer because mm-hmm. I I wouldn't be the one that knew how to do it. Yeah, but that I would have to bring somebody in that was a partner that understood yeah. the business. Yeah, because of the and it's not the same, but there are similarities. Yeah, so I would have to rely on those groomers mm-hmm. to understand the reality. And it could be successful. It could be unsuccessful, but you're going to have to eventually understand all of the components to that business. Yeah. You're going to eventually have to understand all of the things that go into that business being successful, Mm -hmm. right? The only reason I'm able to do the job that I'm able to do is because I learn from all of my clients what their job is and how they do it as I'm doing the content, Mm -hmm. right? So I don't, I I can't be a lawyer and I can't be a dog groomer, but I certainly know more things about those things now than I ever did before, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So the point is, is, there's correlations in success. Yeah. It takes the same things to win a championship mm-hmm. as it does to win at success in business. Yep. There are there are similar attributes across the board of sacrifice, mm-hmm. of intensity, mm-hmm. of working through the pain, of understanding that oh, not every day is going to be easy. No. Right? Like yeah. 
And those are the things that allow you to drive yourself. And then there's also the learning process, yep. right? Like people always question me like, well, I don't understand what you say when, when you say winners fail. Yep. Winners fail because sure. winners don't give up. Mm-hmm. When it gets hard, they figure out how to do it right or right. better or more. Yeah. They don't stop. Yeah. And well, it's, it's even still, you know, I've been open for three years, but I'm still learning on how to yeah. run it better, more efficient, mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I'm going on five years and we're still, yeah. every day we're changing shit. Every day yeah. we're figuring stuff out. Every yeah. day we're going, Well, how right. do we do this? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and mm-hmm. then we're trying to keep up with the algorithms. We're trying to keep up with the different types of videos. And we're trying to keep up with the different ways of storytelling and the, right. the pace and the rhythm and mm-hmm. the, the styles and the everything that everybody wants or needs. Yeah. And dealing with the people. Dealing with the people is always the hardest part. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm lucky. I have great clients. Yeah. But I only have great clients because I get rid of the shitty ones. <laughs> <laughs> like I just, I don't deal with them anymore. Yeah. And then sometimes clients leave me because of whatever decision they make yeah. to leave. But I'm still friendly with them and cordial with them. And they still call me and say, hey, can we yeah. do this? Or, hey, can we do that? And I'm like, yeah, well, we can do that. No problem. Yeah. All you can do is do your best. And then when something happens, do your best to make it right. And then. Well, some business. Uh-huh. Well, some people also don't do a good job of running their business, and they end up getting themselves into a financial situation yeah. where they can't afford our service anymore. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you got to cut. You have to cut somewhere. So yeah, you have to. You're gonna have to take on your content yourself again. Yeah. Had you made these other decisions, mm-hmm. you wouldn't have had to do that. Sneezy. You're all right over there. Jim sneezy today. It's crazy. I know. <laughs> um, the dog hairs. But it's all about. Sure. It's all about understanding the path. Yeah. It's all about understanding what it takes to get to where you want to go. And then you have to decide sometimes during that journey and sometimes at the end of that journey, do I still want this? Mm-hmm. And that that's across the board and everything. That's your relationships. Yeah. That's your, Let me ask you a question. Yeah, go for it. Did you ever have yeah. like when you were, um, you know, a clown and like... What other stuff did you do? Oh, the making movie thing. Did you ever have like a like a restlessness that was just never able to be, you know, what do you call that? Settled? Not settled, but. Um, Def- I, I don't fully understand what you're asking. Like you just felt like. Like it wasn't enough? Yeah, it wasn't enough. You just felt like I'm supposed to be doing something and I, and I think it's this. I still have that feeling. R- That's why we're doing okay. a podcast right okay. now. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. It's also a curse (laughs) because it feels like it's a never ending. You get that, that you reach that goal, you get that achievement and you're get that high for like five minutes. And then you're like, okay, what's next? Well, no, (laughs) because video has been constant. Okay. Film has been constant. Yeah. I love film. I love telling stories. Yeah. I love sharing stories. I love being involved in stories. Right. So everything that I've done in addition to has been adding to the film Mm -hmm. piece, Mm -hmm. right? It's been adding to the entertainment and or education of something. Yeah. Right. So people don't know who I am. They're finding out who I am now. And they're people that choose to listen and people that choose to be involved and people that choose to comment or share or engage with me. I engage back. I think that there, I think there's value in me engaging Mm -hmm. um, partially because I like it. Yeah. I enjoy people, yeah. whether they're being mean or not. It doesn't like I don't get hurt. Like my feelings don't get hurt by people I don't know. Okay. It's not possible. Okay. Like if I don't know you, you can't hurt my feelings. So I think it's weird. It's I, a superpower. Maybe. Or maybe it's just it's just you know, alligator skin from my childhood. Maybe. Like I just I made a decision early on that oh, I don't know you like that. So you don't know me like that. So yeah. good for you. Yeah. Like if that it tells me more about you than it does about me. Mm-hmm. And then I think it's funny to be like, oh, well, you like you didn't quit eating cheeseburgers. And it's like, mm, no, I didn't. I like them. <laughs> I didn't I didn't quit that. You're right. So good on me. Yeah, Worked yeah, through yeah. the pain of swallowing that one. Yeah. But it's the idea of adding more to my life mm-hmm. is what keeps me alive. Yeah. Literally. Mm-hmm. I if, think it's human nature to always have to be moving forward and building and figuring out and challenging yourself if my husband always says idle hands are the devil's playground there has to be 
you know, you have to have something that you, you're working towards or do something. Well, I just, I think life is for living. Yeah. So I live my life. Yeah. And I do all the shit that I want to do. Yeah. Like, I'm not a world traveler. I don't want to travel really. I so do. So I put everything I have into my <laughs> job. Into my business. <laughs> I do, but I can't right now. Yeah. For multiple reasons. It's stressing me out. Um, but I would love to see the world. Mm-hmm. It's it's on my list. Maybe when you're older. Yeah. I mean, it's on my list Maybe of things to do, but instead I'm building the house of my dreams. Yeah. Like, that's that's what I'm engaging in for my... Like, life is for living. Yeah. And if you're not living, then what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> right. Like, do but, shit that you yeah, love. Yeah, but, but even when you say that, though, there are so many people out there that are... It's like, like what does that mean? Life is worth life. Like I wake up every day and I. Life is for living. It means, it means that if you can't find things that excite you every day. Yeah. What the fuck are you doing? Right. You're wasting. Like all you have is time. Then why are we creating a a society of people that don't want to do anything? Who's we? I'm not creating that society. Are you? No, but I just feel like... There that, are people out there that are. Yeah. But there are a vast number why would of people you, out there that aren't. Like, why would you... Want that? Yeah. I don't think that they know what they're doing. Why would you want people to, like, no, to get handouts and all this, you know? I, just don't, I don't That's think not what's what would help them. If you're depressed, you have to, like, get out and walk and do something. Yes. If you just... Well, what people have to understand... Well. This is a multi-layered conversation that I'm excited to have. Mm. It's, oh, no. It's... <laughs> he brought it up. <laughs> I didn't. You did. I know. Um, no, it's the idea of thinking that people are purposely creating people that aren't going to do something is not accurate. One, I think they're do. I think they believe truly that they're helping. I think that they believe that they are helping people that are less fortunate that need some sort of assistance. I just don't think they're giving it in a way that is actually helpful. When, when your child gets hurt, Mm -hmm. you can either tell them to walk it off Mm -hmm. or you can tell them now don't do that ever again. Well, you have a child and you have a child in sports. Correct. And you are a proponent of, winning and have yeah. you have you experienced the um everyone gets a trophy kind of thing yeah and i make my daughter throw them away <laughs> well, i that's, literally well, that's what i'm talking about why my mother we, yelled at me one day well that's doing why it. are we creating a society where it's okay if you don't want to win because there was it's a okay if you don't there's a large group of kids that aren't good enough at certain things that but their parents can't. make them do so everybody gets an award they think they're doing something. I don't believe they're doing it out of, I, I think they're doing it out of ignorance. I think they're doing it thinking that they're helping and not knowing the damage that they're actually causing in the long run. Not everybody has a social, like not everybody studies psychology. Not everybody studies people and not everybody is successful. Yeah. So, and there are a lot of people out there that have trauma. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of people out there that were hurt by their parents being overbearing or their parents forcing them to do things that they didn't want to do or didn't like to do. My kid does stuff that she enjoys Mm -hmm. because when she tries something, I say, do you like this thing enough for me to put my money into it? Yeah. And then when she says, yes, I make her continue with the thing that she put, I put the money into. Yeah. Right. I don't let her quit in the season. Right. Like, she oh, can, we've already at the done. end of it, yeah. she can't. We've already started. Like, she played travel basketball. Yep. She played the entire season. Mm-hmm. And then she quit. She didn't like it. Because, well, she didn't like the team. She didn't like some of the other things. She didn't like the way that certain things were going. And she really loved softball, and she missed it. So she went to softball again. Mm-hmm. You know, she took a break from softball to play basketball. And yeah. she preferred softball to basketball. Yeah. There's, there's also things... Uh, about life that not everybody understands not everybody like i've traveled our country i've seen all of it yeah i've seen the south i've seen the west i've seen the midwest i've seen the east coast i've seen the north i've seen the deep south yeah i've seen arkansas Mm -hmm. i've seen mississippi i've seen new orleans Mm -hmm. i've also seen north dakota and i've had conversations with people in all those places yeah there is a vast difference yeah in our country state to state yeah 
Like, just look at Massachusetts versus Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, there's so much difference in culture just from Massachusetts to Connecticut to New York. Mm-hmm. Like, look at there's a there's a different fucking accent in New York than in Massachusetts. Oh, Mass- oh well, yeah. I thought you were saying people say Connecticut people have accents. Right, but there are. Do we? But New York and yeah, we do. It's the lack of. There oh, are certain right. like we don't. We don't use the double T, so cotton. We don't say cotton properly. Cotton. Cotton. Yeah, we don't say that. Cotton. That's the proper English way to say it with cotton. the T's. We say cotton. Oh. We leave them out. Oh. Butter. Yeah. DD. <laughs> yeah. So there's water, right? Water. water. Right? So Maybe you, it's our T's. It's our T's. Yeah. We lose our T's in Connecticut. Okay. Massachusetts loses their R's. Interesting. Right? I'll have to pay more attention to that. So it's, there are, there are these, the idea that there is a, a one solution for everybody thing mm-hmm. is a difficult thing to understand. And I don't think people are trying to give handouts to make a weaker society. I think they're trying to give handouts to help society lift itself up. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that they're truly thinking about what it means to work for your share, mm-hmm. right? There's the, you know, there's the idea of hunters and gatherers, right? You did the hunting and you did the gathering, yeah. so now we can have a full meal, yep. right? We don't, we don't believe in well, that everyone has to all contribute. the way right now. Everybody has to contribute. Yeah. But we, you know, we went through a pandemic mm-hmm. and people got scared mm-hmm. and people got lazy mm-hmm. and people didn't push through and i think that that's an outcome of everybody gets a trophy (laughs) but you know i like i said earlier like i make my daughter throw them away did you earn that that's what i ask her did you earn that yeah and she'll be like well i participated i said well you don't get a trophy for participating you get a trophy for winning so did you win were you the best because it's fine if everybody else got one and you were the best then that's great. Like yeah. if you had a, you know, if the like, if, not really. <laughs> right. And that's what she did. And, and like she owned it. Yeah. Right. So she was sad that she had to throw it away, but she owned the fact that she didn't earn it. Yeah. But that's just what I believe. I mm-hmm. believe you're supposed to earn stuff. Yeah. I believe that you have to work hard. What's wrong with working hard? What else are you going to do? Not work hard, I guess. I guess. Well, that's where the whole live your life thing gets confusing because you're like i'm supposed to work hard but then i want to live my life yeah, but and it's like but then i gotta work 40 hours a week but yolo but life is for living h- in the sense that if you're doing a job that you are right. excited no, about I know what you mean. right that's part of the but living. i'm just like, saying a lot of people get it mixed up i created a business that i like to go to every day i like the people also, that i work with i like the clients that i have i like what i do I'm excited and I'm always trying to think of new things to do. Yes. And it's easy for me to pitch what I do to new clients. As am I. But I'm talking about these people like in their 20s. You're not supposed to be doing all that now. Okay. You're not supposed to be traveling and spending all your money and running up credit card debt. You're supposed to be working and building a skill. So eventually in your 40s, 50s, 60s. You're pointing at the wrong group of people. No, I know. I'm I'm I'm, I'm just making a statement. Right. But you're saying these 20 year olds are doing this. Oh, who parented them? The parents of those people are the ones you have to blame. The parents of those. Yeah, but they're now adults. They're now adults. But the parents are still allowing them to be kids living in their house. They're not kicking them out. They're not letting them fly. They're not setting them up to fail. If you do not fail, you cannot succeed. But as an adult, you then at some point have to say, yes, I'm in charge. It's nobody's job to take care of you. Correct. As an adult. At a certain point, you do have to take ownership for being an adult. Yeah. However, if you go from child to adult Mm -hmm. in your 20s and your parents allowed you to stay home and Mm -hmm. paid for everything, Mm -hmm. then it can't possibly be on that child because they haven't been told to grow up yet. If at 18, you don't go to school or get a job in an apartment. Yeah, but you at some point you have to have as what happened with me. I graduated high school. I had a job. It was my own internal insight to be like, and well, I can't live with my mo- 21. Okay. But you were also raised in a different group of people. 
It's the parents that are raising the now 18 to 25s that you have to ask them the question, not the 20 year old. Yes, it's it's we want the 20 year old to, to make that decision on their own because they're an adult. Yeah. But what you're missing is, is that fact that their 40 or 50 year old parent is allowing it to occur. They're the ones that are saying it's OK. Yeah. They're the ones that gave the participation trophies. They're the ones that said, oh, honey, that's OK. They're the ones that said, oh, you need money. You don't need a job here. I'll give you money. Uh, yeah. They they took it but very those personally. Parents, but those parents aren't going to live forever. So no. what's going to happen when they die? Your, then, your child's going to be crippled. Yes. You're they crippling are. them. Yes, they are. But that again, that's not on the 20 year old as much as it's on the parent. You have to look at the 50-year-olds and say, bro, kick your fucking kid out. Well, how do you do that? How do you broach that topic? Like this. Bro. No. If you got a 20-year-old living in your house, kick them the fuck out if they're not in school. <laughs> like that. I'm not going to go there. Because Tyler. <laughs> he doesn't live with his parents. No, I know. I but know. that's the reality. That You cannot win if you don't fail. Like my husband. Moved. Nobody has ever accomplished anything without failing at it first. Right, right, right. Why is it such a bad thing to fail? Because people are scared of it. You know what's scarier? Because people get mocked at it. Do you know what's it? scarier? What? Not doing it and then being yeah. on your deathbed and realizing, shit, regret. I should have did that. Oh, I can't live with the regret. I'd rather fail. Yeah. But that's, I have to at least try. But that's a winning attitude. At that's try. taught. Yeah. That's. I can only hope. I pass there, it to my but there's, girls. <laughs> Yeah, we can only hope, but yeah. there are things that we do in our life that teach that. Like, I know that I learned a lot from my parents, mm -hmm. not from them telling me, yeah, but showing. from them showing me. That's what My I dad worked in a factory mm -hmm. when I was little. Mm -hmm. We lived on a little house on a lake. That's pretty my nice. mom was a waitress. Mm -hmm. Then my dad decided, oh, okay. They won't let me move up because I don't have a college degree. I'm going to go become a plumber. So then he went and became a plumber and got his license yep. and started his own business. Yep. Then we moved into a really big house that he built himself in a new town in the woods on a bunch of land. And then my mom went from being a waitress to being a secretary. Yep. And then my mom was a secretary for years. So my mom worked for my dad and my dad and they ran a family business. And then my parents decided I don't want to do this anymore. So my mom then went back to school and became a social worker and a therapist. Yeah. And then my dad went back to school and became a teacher and started teaching plumbing and heating. Yeah. So I learned at my whole life that you don't have to be stuck. Yeah. If you don't like doing something, fucking stop doing it and go do something else. Yeah. That's okay to do. Yeah. That's not quitting. That's deciding. Well, it, but it's you may, if you do that, have to be uncomfortable. You will a little be while. uncomfortable. You may have to eat that chicken and broccoli yes. or hot dogs and mac and cheese. Yeah. You I, have th I think that's also something that society doesn't show is success. What did that person have to do to get there? Yeah. You know, I've had my own You have to give You've something up own. to get more. Sure. That's how it works. You have to be uncomfortable. Like, we're about to build our dream home, the, the home that me and her have talked about yep. our entire relationship. Yep. And we decided we were going to... Are you we moving away? Huh? Are you moving away? No, we're buying... Are you town. staying in we'll town? We'll talk about it later. Okay. I don't need a public knowing where I live. <laughs> Too many mean people out there say mean things to me. I don't need fat shaming on my lawn. Uh, Thank you. It's, it's actually... You could just Google me and you'd find where I live. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we're times. buying something in town. Um, but no. Th but my point of, the, of that is that I live my life as if it is a... a book or a movie or a story because i believe that i want to live a life that is worth telling mm -hmm. my parents story is one of the most amazing love stories ever told yeah period yeah like it's it's fucking incredible yeah and for me like that's a, like you could make a movie about my parents life yeah and it's watchable yeah. it's fucking watchable like you have these two kids that grew up near each other but didn't know each other. Yeah. They met each other. Then they decided within six weeks to get married, and then yeah. they they couldn't have kids themselves. They were having trouble having kids, so they decided to adopt kids. Then they ended up having their own kid. Then they decided to adopt. Only biological yeah, children? and then they decided to adopt more kids. And through the whole thing, nothing broke them. Yeah. 
You're saying they're still crazy about each other. They they are still fully committed to each other, fully yeah. in love. You will never meet any two people that are more in love than my parents. Yeah. I challenge you to find them. Mm-hmm. They're annoyingly in love. <laughs> but that, to me, is what life is about. Yeah, it's I a, love that. It, and it doesn't have to be a love story. Mm-hmm. It can be a story about whatever you want that story to be. Yeah. My story is different than somebody else's story. But my, I think that when I die, my story will be worth telling. Yeah. I want my kid and my grandkids, if I have them or anybody that knows me, yeah. to be like, yeah, but remember this. I yeah, know. but remember this. Yeah. Like when I, was in, when I was in New York and I was going to acting school, I had two very close friends. And they would call me the black hole of time. Because... And that's where Black Full of Thumbs came from. Because literally we would leave school at 3 o'clock and the next thing they knew it was 4 o'clock in the morning. And they were like, where did time go? Danny, what are we doing? And I was like, what do you mean? We're just walking. And we'd literally walk around the city for 12 hours just talking and doing shit. And that's all we would do. Unplugged. Like I just... Back back then, yeah. I think I had a cell phone back then, but it wasn't... No text. No internet. There was texting. It was like... Oh. One, one button. Beep, yeah, beep, 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 yeah. Miss the beep. Yeah. Son of a bitch all the way back around. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, it was, yeah. you know, and then I would go to a bar. There was a bar that I, at the Bull Moose Saloon. I remember it fucking well. I was, I was 19 years old when I moved to New York. And I worked at ESPN Zone in Times Square, and everybody went to this bar after work. And technically, I wasn't allowed in it. Yeah. But they knew I didn't drink. So the bartender slash owner... I did my homework at the bar, had a burger, drank a soda, and hung out with everybody. And they ended up, the owner ended up loving me. And I would literally would stay there and play pool with the owner and the bartender until 7 in the morning. Yeah. And then I'd go home, I'd shower, I'd get dressed, and I'd go to school. Yep. And I'd do it all over again. Wow. And I'd sleep like two hours a night. Wow. Or I'd take a nap in the afternoon sometimes. Wow. But that's all I did. Yep. Because I loved living. I still love living. Mm-hmm. Like and I enjoy watching stories. I enjoy watching movies. I enjoy watching shows. I enjoy. I fucking love stories. Yeah, you like movies and shows so I've and stuff. Wrapped my life around stories and shows and mm-hmm. everybody else's stories. Mm-hmm. Really intriguing to me. Yep, I like other people's stories too. I very rarely get into the whole new Netflix series or what are people binge watching. But if there's a documentary about somebody great like Michael Jordan. Tanya Harding or something, you know. So yeah. I, I'm just enthralled with, you know, the um, I like the, it all. Uh, the underdogs. Oh my god! And you were there at the Kentucky Derby when that fucking horse won. I, I would have lost my shit. That is the greatest comeback story. Yeah, I'm still annoyed. I've ever heard. I always my, I on watched the worst that. Bet I still and I didn't that day. But I watched that footage and I see the picture of that horse and I just I'm right. so inspired by it. But that's what I mean. Like, that's something that I lived through. Like I was there. Yeah. I was there that yeah. day. Yeah. Like but even from where you were sitting, you couldn't see how he was maneuvering, right? Yes, I could. It oh, was right in front of me. It all happened literally right in front of me. Oh, my God. It was incredible. Yeah. It was right there. Unbelievable. It I was just, insane. I love, that, I just love stuff like that. It was insane. It was awesome. But yeah, that's I, what I mean I have, about I have, life is worth living. I have like, to print out a picture. I spent a stupid horse. amount of money on that trip. <laughs> like, and I'm seeing, like... It was an obscene amount of money for the amount of money I was making at the time. Yeah. But we wanted to do it. It yeah. was on a bu- it was a bucket list thing. It was like sure. I want to do this like well, would I do it again? Probably not. I would do it with a bunch of friends yeah. if they wanted to do it, but yeah. I wouldn't do it just us again. Yeah. But if a group of friends was like, "Hey, we're going to go to the Kentucky Derby." I'd be like, "But that was mm, the I greatest win." I mean, Secretary, I think was like yeah, the only that one was, that held like a If they're not making like a that. movie about that horse. Oh my gosh. Like that's He was so small and he was He wasn't even supposed to be in the race. No. Last minute. He wasn't even supposed to be in the race. No. And that's why I'm kicking and myself because he kept going. Because Li- I think going. I don't know if Liza made a comment or I made a comment to myself or what it was, but something triggered me to be like, I'm not gonna waste a hundred dollars on the worst bet this time. So I made some other Damn. dumb bet where I was like, I'm gonna bet on number seven in every race. Yeah. Instead. Yeah. Whereas normally I'd be like, what's the worst odds? <laughs> Give me a hundred on that one. Two hundred on glue stick, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like whatever it is, right? So. But yeah. I just love that. Yeah. That's, but, but to be there was great. Right. And those are the things that I'm talking about. Life is worth living, but you can't do that without working hard. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't have those adventures and you can't have those things happen in your world. Mm-hmm. 
if you don't set yourself up to be able to do those things in your world. Sure. And, you know, people can give me shit about the way that I raise my kid and people can give me shit about the type of person I am. Frankly, I don't give a fuck. But I've lived a really good wor- life worth living. Mm-hmm. And I'm continuing to wor- live that life worth living. Yeah. Right. And I and I don't I don't have any regrets. I don't have anything that I'm looking back on. Oh, I wish I did that. Yep. I that, look at my life and I go, that's I important. did all the shit that I wanted to do. Yeah. And I'm still doing too. shit that I want to do. Yeah. No regrets. But even doing this podcast is part of storytelling and part of what I love. It's just an addition to the rest of the stuff that I do. I think it's the regret thing. Yeah, I can't live with that. Even if it's like, you know, yeah. my back in the day, my friends not used to go to the to the clubs when that was a thing you go dancing you know whatever and um we used to like get up on the stage and and dance and stuff and i if i was you know three years younger than what i was which was 18 19 yeah i would have been like that's crazy but then i was like no i'm gonna regret it if i don't get up there and do it and it wasn't anything like crazy but it's just small little things like that where it's like if i leave and i don't get up there with my friends am i gonna drive home in the car and be like i should have got up there so I would do skydiving, stuff like that. My brother was like, let's just yeah. do it. I don't think I do it today. But yeah. <laughs> but it's those kind but of at things. Least you do, yeah. You don't want to drive home and be like, God and damn it. And it doesn't have to be crazy it. stuff either. Like no. M- before Liza and I decided to get married, the conversation of kids came up. Yep. And she's like, well, you, you haven't had any kids. And I was like, right. But I have Brianna. Yeah. I love her. She's mine. Yeah. But I also know that I was raised with six adopted kids and I was the one biological. And there are two caveats to when I adopted Brianna that I I actually gave up wanting kids of my own when I had when I adopted her. Okay. Because I don't know if it's real or not, but in my head my parents never loved me differently than my my siblings from what I could gather. Yep. Like I, like, I always felt like they were treated the same way yeah. I was treated. I don't think that they were treated more. I don't think that they were treated less. I think that it was it was pretty equal. And I think that, honestly, that bothered me as a biological kid. Yeah. Because I felt like there was moments in my life where were I felt like... Were they younger than you? They were babies? Some of them were younger. Some of them were older. So they just needed more attention? Well, no. They also had childhood trauma, and they had other stuff going yeah. on, and they had, oh. they had all kinds of shit. They, they had baggage. They had shit going on. Yeah. But again, they loved us equally. But I had the feeling of, well, I'm biological. Like, I'm yours. Doesn't that make it different? Like, isn't that? Yeah. So I don't think my parents ever had that, and I don't know if there are other parents that have that, but on the off chance that if I had a kid mm-hmm. and there was a different connection with that kid than there was with her, I don't think I'd ever forgive myself. So you chose not to have any more children? Correct. Because I, I did not want to put her in that position mm. of my weakness, mm-hmm. of my inability to be equal yeah. in my love for them. Yep. That was my choice. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I don't regret that. No. No, if you can make peace with it. Yeah. And you're don't, fine. Yeah, I made that fine. choice. Yeah. Before I even... Before I even took her in, like I'm okay. Yeah. I was like, "This is this means that I can't ever have my own." Yeah, I can't ever, you know. And there's gonna be people that are like, "She is your own. She, it, she is mine, and I love her, and she knows I love sure. her." But the reality is that she's not from me. I know what you mean. Do you um, think that that happens with surrogacy? I don't know. I know. Maybe that's a wild journey too. Yeah, it's. For the bo- is, birth mother yeah, and also the new. Life fucking complicated. Do you have that bond? Like, I'll never know what it is carry. to be pregnant, but I can't imagine growing a human being I for know. nine months. Yeah. You can't be attached to it in some way. But there are people all the time, like Brianna's mom gave her up, so what do I know? Yeah. Maybe people are just built that way. I don't know. Well, usually, so, well, I don't say usually, but there's a, uh, addiction involved or they just can't care for that child and so they have to give them up for I mean, you can call but, it addiction but these, sur- or whatever but you these want, surrogate but, like, that's parents are not struggling with that stuff. I don't buy into the whole addiction thing oh. like yes people are addicted to stuff but people use it as a fucking crutch and an excuse a lot <clears throat> well no I'm saying addiction well, I'm an and then they're in and out of jail so yeah. you can't take care of your kids yeah well that you can make a better choice 
You can choose that your kid is more important than those other things. You can, yeah. You can choose that your kid is more important than drugs. You can choose that your kid is more important than being a thief. You can choose that your kid is more important yeah. than, like, there are ways to get jobs. Yeah. There are, there are subsidies and there are help out there for you to get your shit together so you can raise your kid. Yeah. You're choosing that over your child. Yeah. So I don't buy into addiction. It's a I don't, sad thing, I think, yeah. I think, it, I think people allow addiction to be a crutch and we allow people to victimize themselves with addiction. Yeah. And I, I grew up with addicted people. I have children from addicted people. Fuck that noise. <laughs> if you're an addict, get your shit together. That's well, we all know, you know, when we were kids, don't, don't do drugs. Don't do. So how are you even getting entangled in that mess? Childhood trauma. Some people, their parents were into it. Some I know. people. It's so hard to judge because you don't know. Really. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just letting you know that, like, as, like you said earlier about the 20 year olds, as an adult, <laughs> at a certain point, you have to look at yourself in the fucking mirror and say, yeah, I am going to choose to be better than this. And some people just aren't built that way. Some people just aren't built to want to be better. Uh, it and just takes an incredible amount of courage and strength to look inward. I yes, just, and I want that for people. And so I'm not saying I. it's going to be easy. But it's sometimes so it's I. like, you know, you want to help somebody and you can't help someone that doesn't want to help themselves. You have to and so know, you have to back off and be like. <sighs> you have to know where it came from. You have to look at your life and know where it started. Yeah. You have to look at. Yeah, but now you're saying, but before you were saying blame the parents, now you're saying it's the adult now. At a certain point, you have to look at, even even those kids, the 20-year-old kids, the reason why I'm By saying- 23. But, By 23. But what I'm saying about the 20-something-year-old kids, if the parent never kicks them out, then they're never going to grow up. Yeah. You're not, like, mo the majority, especially boys, mm -hmm. are not going to look at their life and go, you want me to make it harder? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll leave. Mm -hmm. No, they have to be. They have to be told. It's time for you to get your place. It's time for you to do this. Yeah. It's time. Like girls are built different than boys. Mm -hmm. That's just real. Yeah. And most boys need a strong woman to even survive. Mm -hmm. That's just real. Yeah. Like I don't make the rules. That's just real. Like they're like it's hard for boys to get their shit together. Yeah. Until later in life. You know what's scary about parenting? Mm. That you don't Everything. realize you did a good job till the end, and you can't go back, and that terrifies me. <laughs> you know I'm what? a fairly new mom. I have a three, a two year old, and a five year old, and I'm I'm already worried about. Oh my god! You know what I can tell you about that is that no matter what you do, it's not on you as a parent. They're going to become whoever they're going to become. Uh, kind you of, can you help. Know. You can guide. Uh, you can you can set them up for success as much as you want. Yeah. You can love them as much as you want. Yeah. But whoever they choose to be, mm -hmm. they're going to be. And there's nothing you can do about it as a parent. Yeah. And people can tell me that I'm full of shit. Well, it's just you hear stories about, you I know. am one of seven. Yeah. And I have a pretty good test tube of, like, I have a good scientific yeah. group of, of study put together. Yeah. Of all these kids that were loved the same and treated the same in the same house that started at different times in that house. Yeah. And I can tell you right now that nurture kicks the shit. Like nature kicks the shit out of nurture a lot. Hmm. What is in your child's nature? You can you can nurture it hmm. and you can push it in a certain direction and hope for the best. Yeah. But the reality is, is their nature is going to kick in. Yeah. And that's what's going to occur. And it's not worth like trying to fight fight it. Oh no, I it's guess. worth it's worth fighting. Okay. It's worth being the parent, but what you cannot do is blame yourself. You cannot be a parent and look at your children and say, I failed or I succeeded. Mm -hmm. You don't get like you don't get to take the credit for that and you don't get to take the blame for that. Mm -hmm. That's a big to me that's a big misnomer. Whatever success my kid has, that's hers. I guided I, I it. I guess so, but and I, I put it. I put her in the place to be successful, yeah. and I put her in the I gave her the opportunities to be successful. But it's up to her to decide the type of person she wants to be in those circumstances. Right, but I don't look back on my life and think that I think I am who I am because of both of my parents. Sure, part of it, 
they had influence. Yeah. But you chose who you were going to be. Yeah. You chose the type of person you were going to be. Yeah. Your your nature came in and, and played a big factor mm-hmm. in who you are and what you're like. I knew that I was intrigued by people very early on because I was surrounded by such fucking weirdos. Like, we, I mean, we would go to group therapies. We would go to, you know, you're talking about your siblings? Therapy. Yeah. Like, yeah. I would, like, they were, you know, I love them as, I don't love them that much, to be honest. I don't like my, my siblings very much at all. Oh, you don't talk to any of them? I don't talk to any of them. Oh. Um, there's a couple that I love. But is that because of trauma for them? That because they were adopted and they didn't have biological yes. parents? So, it's, yes. oh my God, so it doesn't really matter. But at a certain point as an adult who has my own kid, I have to make a decision what's good for my life. Mm-hmm. Just because you had trauma doesn't mean I have to accept that and I have to allow you to be in my life polluting my life forever. Right. Like, you you know, you get a few passes – yeah, eventually. You but have eventually, to as an adult, like we've said there. multiple times, you have to at some point look at your life and say, okay, I'm going to decide to do better. Mm-hmm. And if you don't look at your life and decide to do better, that's that's on you. Yeah. And in my experience, it's their nature. Well, I think, too, um, wanting to do better is, you know, it has to do with self-esteem. It has yeah. to do with wanting to. Uh, we've had this conversation before. But you have to before. do the work. Yeah. But people don't realize that it will make you feel good. It's Nobody wants to be a bum. Nobody wants to be a, a mooch. Nobody wants to have no goals or no... I don't... It doesn't make you feel good to be like that. I don't know the answer to that. I think there are people out there that, that want to be those things. No, I think they're all miserable. They're full of it. You don't want to be on your video games for 16 hours a day with no job and it there's no way well there's first people all, that are happy looking like people living like that first of all if i'm if i'm allowed to be on a game for 16 hours that's a just day an and example I don't have, but if i don't have to i don't like somebody else is the problem because somebody else is supplying the games and somebody else is supplying supplying you the hear about and adults the living in their basements all the time like i know that. i know of adults that have literally lost their entire homes yeah. playing video games yeah like literally have lost their oh, house gambling no oh playing video games like World of Warcraft consumed them so much that they stopped going to work and they lost their home, they lost their wives, they lost their families. No. Yeah. Because they're addicted to the way it feels to be involved in that emotional experience with those other people. I was so bad at video games. People are ad- I don't get it. <laughs> people are addicted to the emotion behind stuff. Oh, like stuff. anything else, yeah. So if you're an alcoholic or yeah. if you're a drug addict. Yeah. You're addicted to the emotional experience that you had the first time. Mm-hmm. Whatever it was that, that happened that first time, that's what you're, you're searching for. It You're chasing it. That's what they always say, too. You're chasing that first high. Yeah. You always want to get back there. But put your time and effort into something else. Sure, but they don't. It's really hard. You're making me contradict myself a lot, or at least sound <laughs> like I'm contradicting myself a lot. I'm looking at the <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm not contradicting myself. I'm just like, the thing is, is I understand why it's happening, but I don't accept it as an acceptable thing for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And the answer is get help. The answer is somebody in your life that's enabling you to a certain point to be all of that. Instead of walking away from you needed to at a certain point say, okay, you need help. I'm going to help you get the help. Instead of paying for all this other shit, I'm going to pay for you to get help. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm going to pay for you to see a professional yeah. on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So instead of spending $200 a month on video games for you and access to video games or whatever it is you're addicted to, I'm going to spend $200 a month on getting you help. Yeah. We're going to figure go. this out. And you have to go and you, you have to do this. There. And at a certain point, you have to be strong enough to walk away from those people as well. Yeah. There's been many a people in my life that I have loved dearly, including my siblings, that I had to walk away from. Yeah. Because they're not healthy. They don't make good decisions. Mm-hmm. And I can't have them in my life. Which is sad oh, yeah. to a certain point, but at another point it's like Well, it's toxic to keep it's people. It's just toxic. Yeah, you have like, to what's sur- the point? you have to surround yourself with yeah. Right. People that are like, Yeah. Not like, what do you want to do that for? Well, you have to surround yourself with people that are going to lift you up, not bring you down. Yeah. And the more you surround yourself with with people that are bringing you down, the farther down you're going to go. Yeah. People get heavy. 
They get very heavy. Yeah, I was never really one to h- hang on to toxic relationships, like a, whether it be boyfriends or friends that just I grew out of. You know, just because it was like. It's all hard. Sorry. Life is hard. Yeah. Life is full of challenges. Life yeah, it's, is it's full all of about the ebb and flow of figuring it out and won't do that again and then you try something out it's like you know that's it's all and so there's that it's if all you're and, not open to learning yeah how life works right you're gonna be really bad at life <laughs> well and that's real i've met tons of people that are really <laughs> charismatic and really fun to be around but yeah. really shitty at life mm. and the reality is is if they if they took the time to understand how life worked they would probably be a hell of a lot better at it mm-hmm. and they probably would be a hell of a lot more successful and have a lot more money and have a lot more freedom to do the things that they want to do yeah you know like well, my baby I brother I is one of the most charismatic funny fucking people you will ever meet yeah but he's an asshole oh. and he can't help himself no like a ama- mate like but he doesn't want to take the time to learn how life works. Okay. He just wants to do what he's doing. Okay. Right? Yeah, you got to be like, yeah. Yeah, so you have to just be like, well, do you then, boo, do your thing. I don't know what to tell you. Mm-hmm. Right? So, and that's up for us as successful people and people that want to live our life to the fullest to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to need you to go away. Mm-hmm. I'm done with you. I'm mm-hmm. going to walk away from you. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to take a break. I've also from walked people. away from people, as you're referencing, and they weren't by any means children. They were adult men. Yeah, adults. Yeah, they were boyfriends. Yeah. Yeah. I've broken off relationships uh-huh. because that was the best thing for them to make themselves better. Yeah. If you're okay living at home, I'm gonna go try to find an apartment. And I we're am not by, gonna be good together. I am by no means perfect. I am by no means yeah. without flaws. Yeah. I have plenty of them. Yeah. I have I I make mistakes all the time. Yeah. But I'm open to learning from them is the difference. Sure. I'm open to the idea like, oh, I could have done that better. Yeah. Wow, I really fucked that up. Mm-hmm. How much does it matter for me to fix it? Yeah. Right? And I have had relationships in the past with amazing women that were very good women that were strong and smart and funny and talented. Yep. They just weren't where I needed them to be where I was in my life. Sure. And I wanted other things. Yeah. And they just weren't the person for me. Yeah. And then I have my wife now who Mm -hmm. is also a strong, independent, smart, funny, amazing woman who's also a pain in the ass and also kicks my ass most of the time. Yeah. Right? (laughs) But she's helpful. Like she helps me. Sure. Well, you have a common goal. She is, you work together. Yeah. She is not necessarily the most insightful person, but she is often the loudest person, mm-hmm. which can also become insightful. Mm-hmm. When she disagrees with something or doesn't like something, she's not scared to say it. Yeah. It may not be what I would do or how I would do it, but I also believe that people, I believe the most important thing in a relationship, a healthy relationship, is the other person. Mm-hmm. So if I treated her the way that I thought was the best way to treat her, it would never work for her and I. She does not want to be treated that way. Okay. She does not want certain things certain ways all the time. Mm-hmm. Like that that's not how she works. She doesn't want she doesn't want gentle. She doesn't want She's calm. An she doesn't want Yeah, but I love her. Oh, but yeah, she doesn't that's... want and everybody's different. Yeah. You know, the things that in every relationship, things are different. The relationship oh, yeah. you and I have is different than the relationship that I have with, you know, other people that I know and, and work with. Yep. But the most important thing is in our relationship is you. Like, what do you need? What do you want from me? Yeah. And if I'm not willing to give what you need or want from me, that's when I have to make the decision of like, oh, okay, this is not going to be a healthy relationship. I have to walk away. Well, it's meeting in the middle and compromising. I hate compromising. No. Compromising is good. It's not. Compromising. You know what's good? A good compromise. Who says this? A good compromise is with when both parties are dissatisfied. That's terrible. No. You know what's good? That's fair. You know what's good? That's There's fair. nothing fair. Fair is not good. Fair is not equal. Yeah, huh? Equal is not fair. You know what's good? What? Resolution. Resolutions when both people leave satisfied. And they may have to give something up, 
but it's a resolution. It's well, not that's a compromise. the same as compromise. Compromise is no, it's not. Compromise means when you say my computer, you have to give a little. That person has to give a little. No, no, hear me out. Okay, ready? If I say the White House is compromised, do you feel good or do you feel nervous? Nervous. Right. Yeah. So if I say my relationship is compromised, do you think it's good or bad? Well, well, because now do you're it, insinuating you, that compromise is a weak thing. It is. Resolution. If I say okay, I we came to a resolution. I guess it's verbiage. It is verbiage. And that's how all of relationship works. Mm -hmm. Because if I look at you or I look at my wife and we have a disagreement and we come to a resolution that we both can agree on, even if we both lose a little something, it's still a resolution that we're both satisfied with, so nobody leaves with resentment towards the other person. Mm -hmm. But if we both leave dissatisfied, we are both also leaving with resentment that we didn't get what we want. Well, I think that's what that is. It's so leaving. With resentment. Well, you didn't get, yeah, but either one of us got what we wanted, but hey, but if made it's a, a deal. But if we come to a resolution where we're both feeling like we were heard, yeah, and we're both leaving with something for both of us to go, Okay, I got this thing. Okay. This mattered to me. Yeah. I needed this. Yeah. I think it's just a play on words. It is a play on words, but words are important. Okay. To me, words are one of the most important things that we they have in life because people don't understand that your words have meaning, right? Like there's a difference between nice and kind. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between listening and hearing. Okay. Hearing is noise. Listening is comprehension. <laughs> I know what you mean. Right? So the whole point is in a relationship, if you're going to compromise, you're going to have resentment. And the more you compromise, the weaker you get in the relationship. And if you're both compromising, then you're both compromising away from each other. If you have resolutions, you're coming together. Resolution means it's resolved. Resolutions means okay. it's bringing it together. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Compromise means it's separating. Compromise means that you're stepping away from each other. Yeah, usually. And the more that. that you do that with your with significant people in your life, mm -hmm. the worse the relationship's going to get. And whoever taught you that a good compromise is both people leaving disappointed is a it's fucking problem. Not disappointed, dissatisfied. Dis dissatisfied, disappointed. Same, same, same idea. But it's also meeting in the middle, which is a resolution. But, but compromise does not mean meeting in the middle, is my point. Like you can look up the word. Like we can have Tyler look it up so we know the difference. Like I'm happy to do it. Look up the word compromise. <laughs> but whenever you hear the word compromise, it means something is damaged. It does, yeah. But whenever you hear the word resolutions, it means it's fixed. So if I'm in a if I'm in an argument with somebody and I can resolve it, that that's a good thing. Yeah. And I may have to give something up to resolve it, but I'm re I'm giving that up because I but care about isn't you. Isn't that a one side resolve? No, because th if I'm giving it up because well, I love you enough, but if I love you enough, then I'm giving it up for you. Right. And and vice versa. You might, but if we both are on the same page in the relationship, in order for a relationship to work, you both have to be with the same language, and you have to both understand I'm trying to think of the an same. Example. You, you have to st ex understand the same shit. So if if you and I are in a relationship or me and my wife are in our relationship and she looks at it as compromise and I look at it as resolution, then she's always going to feel resentment. But if I can explain to her that I want to find a resolution that we're both happy with, so before we leave this thing, I want to be resolved so that we're both leaving feeling like we're okay. Mm -hmm. And if that means I have to give a little more so she feels okay sometimes, oh. and sometimes she has to give a little more so I feel okay sometimes, that's where we're resolving the issues. Like, if you think that... I see what you're saying. But if, usually a, res a resolve comes from more from one side than the other. It can. Not equal. It can. It can be all three. Do you have that definition? It can be all... Did you look up <laughs> compromise? <Are> you <laughs> what is compromise? An agreement or a settlement... Of a dispute that is reached by each side making various concessions. Concessions. Being a result. Now look up resolution. Resolution. Please hold. Please hold. So my point Pause. is when you when you have the same language with your partner and you understand that you're but on the same page. But to re make a resolution, wouldn't you need to be both emotionally um, available? Uh, no, what's emotionally intelligent? 
yeah, well, you want to be with somebody that's emotionally intelligent. Yeah. So you have to teach them how to be emotionally intelligent. Yeah. And sometimes that takes a long time. Yeah. Go ahead. The action of solving a problem, dispute, or contentious matter. Resolving. There, see, there's no... Do so you see how compromise ended with people giving something up? Yeah. And resolution didn't have any of that. It was just resolving it. Yeah. That's the difference. The difference is, is you're walking away with resentment in a compromise and in a resolution you're not. And sometimes it takes longer to get to a resolution. Sometimes we have to we have to shelve a conversation and say, okay, we're going to come back to this. This isn't done. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you look at things like as simple as like stacking the dishes in the dishwasher. Right. Say you like the, the glasses to be a certain way, but CJ doesn't put them in that way. And every time he does it, it irritates you. So you just start doing it yourself. And every time you do it yourself, that's a compromise. Every time you do it yourself, it means he doesn't care enough about you to put the glass, because it doesn't take any effort to move the glass a half an inch. Uh-huh. It takes zero effort for him. Mm-hmm. He could, lit- But he doesn't understand why it matters. Okay. The only thing that should matter in that circumstance is that it matters to you. Because in that relationship, you're the most important thing to him. Mm-hmm. So that means if I have to put the glass in this way so you don't have to be irritated, that's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. I do all kinds of little things, little things that I know yeah. that Liza gets irritated by that she may not even know that I'm doing half the time because I just stopped doing them because I knew they irritated her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? So I made that decision. Yeah. I made the decision to be like, oh, well, that's not that big a deal to me. So I'm not even going to fight about it. I'm not going to argue about it. And I'm not going to allow her to be upset about it. Yeah. I'm just going to do this thing. Mm-hmm. And then there's some things where I'm like, well, that's stupid. I'm not doing it. And I'll just let her know. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> so I can either not do that thing right. at all, or I can do it the way that I want to do it. And you'll accept it. Yeah. Those are the options that are on the table right now to resolve this. Mm-hmm. Because I'm not going to do it that way because I disagree with the way you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's ways to resolve things that that take tact and they take effort. Mm -hmm. But if you're with somebody that you love and you're with somebody that you want to be with, that effort is worth doing. Right. Right. That would be a compromise. (laughs) That's not a compromise. (laughs) Okay, we can move on. Well, but that's the point is that it's not a compromise because I'm not losing anything. I'm not walking away with resentment. I'm not feeling taken advantage of. Yeah. I'm going I guess I've always thought of compromise as being just yeah, two people just being like fine. Okay. Right, and that's not okay. Yeah, it is. When have you ever heard somebody say that they're fine and they were actually fine? Well, I <laughs> When do people say they're fine? Every time that they're not fine. <laughs> fine is a is a response that people use to say shut up. Okay. How are you? Fine. How's, are you okay? I'm fine. Yeah. Do you need something? I'm fine. Yeah. All that means is get the fuck away from me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure, there's exceptions We're to the rule. We're learning on words today. But that's all part of success. Well, for, for, yeah, big part is listening. And, yeah. Right, but part of success is understanding how words work in order to be successful with clients. Mm-hmm. I can't compromise with my clients because if I compromise with my clients, then I'm going to walk away feeling resentment. They're going to walk away feeling resentment and we're not going to be working together for very long. Yeah. But I also can't compromise my prices. Right. Right. That's a compromise that people look for. Oh, well, if you want to work with me, then it's going to, you have to charge me this much. Yeah. Well, then I I can't work with you. Right. I can compromise myself, but I'll feel resentment every time I'm doing extra work for them Mm -hmm. for less money. Mm -hmm. And my time is being taken away from people that actually respect and value my time and my price and my cost. Mm -hmm. So I would rather give my time to those people. Mm -hmm. Right. But also when I have a client that disagrees with something that I'm doing or the way that I'm doing it, I have to either explain it to them so they understand it. Yeah. Or I have to listen to them and go, okay, that'll work too. Let's do it that way for you because that's what you want. That's how you perceive this. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a business and you think that compromising with your client is going to work, it's not. Like you're a dog groomer. Mm -hmm. If I brought you my doodle and it was all matted 
and I said, brush my dog out. And you said, I can't brush your dog out. And I said, you need to brush my dog out. That's what I want. Would you compromise? Would you say, okay? I guess my example for compromise doesn't really, it's, that's not where I would compromise, but I'm saying. Right. But where you compromise, wherever you compromise, you're, you're caught. I use extremes that you'll understand. Yeah. So we can get to the point of well, compromise I'm is bad. Y okay. I'm just com like compromising. What movie are we going to go see? Like that kind of thing. But that's not really a compromise, is it? Well, if, well if, I wanted to see this one. Well, I want to. How about we see this one on Tuesday, but we'll see this one today. That's a resolution. Okay. You Nobody win, leaves. You win. <laughs> I do that a lot. <laughs> that's the whole point. <laughs> oh. Oh. Kiss. I'm so smart. You just saw those? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kiss. Great. They're fun, right? <laughs> They're up there. They're still going. Yeah. I dressed up as Kiss one year. I did the Manchester did. Road Race. Never trained a day in my life, and I ran, what is that, five miles? Yeah. <clears throat> I almost fucking died. <laughs> At the end, it was the last stretch. Phew. I no. was Gene Simmons. It was a good time. I had a buddy in high school that loved Kiss. Yeah. They're icons. Loved them. They're icons. And Guar. Oh, Wow. The weird. Can't even understand. They're nope. the ones with the animal masks. They have all kinds the, of weird yeah, stuff. Yeah, very gory. Yeah, they're crazy. They spray blood into the crowd, and yeah. Yeah, I think they have like big prosthetic penises too that they yeah, spray people with. Never like very. Them. Yeah, no, me either. I who's was never into this? Kiss either. But who's that there? Which one? The fe the woman. Oh, I forget her name. She was in. Uh, she, I think she was in Moonlighting with Bruce Will. Uh, oh, I don't know. With Bruce Willis. She's great. Yeah, don't know. Yeah, she's a fantastic actress. Oh my God, Abbott and Costello, so yeah. funny. Yeah. But. Cool. What time is it? It's ten after eight. Oh. Why you got a date? Nope. Anything else? Uh, no. Yeah, I don't know. What else you want to talk about? Whatever you want to talk about. Um. I don't know. Do you want to talk about more about? I don't know. You brought up religion earlier, and we're like, I'm going to get back to that. Oh. Oh, no. Just the institution of religion. I just don't really. I don't know. It seems to be a very dark place. I'm all for believing in a higher power and God and all that. I'm but, all but the for. But the institution of religion is out of control. I'm all for everybody doing what, what suits them and is what's safe for others. Yeah. If it's If it's not safe for others, I don't get behind it. Right. The idea of like moving priests around that are touching kids, I can't get behind. That's that. kind of when it changed for me. Was when that whole thing came out about the Catholic Church, and I was, I was raised, you know, Catholic and everything. And um, my kids aren't baptized, but I didn't. I don't know. It kind of I mean, skewed the whole thing. Well, I don't really need my kids to be baptized for them to be good people. No, those people were baptized, and they were not good people. <laughs> Right. That's kind of how I felt about it. But I, well, st I still may. I may not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't have the answer. If I had the answer, I'd yeah. speak on it more. I, I mean, I have my own spirituality that yeah. is mine, and you need it to have sure. balance in your I life. I talk to somebody. I don't know who's up there. But. I mean, I think we all talk to somebody at some point. Yeah. I think there's always a moment where we all go, you know, fuck, come on, man. You know, <laughs> like I think there's always – the hopes that somebody's listening that's going to, you know, lend a helping hand. Sure. But I don't, I don't know how it works. I think that we're all, I think we're all balls of energy and the idea of a yeah, soul Yeah, the is whole just, universe thing just, yeah, that's, fascinates me too. That's what I, I believe that. I believe that yeah. we're just, I believe, you know, our brain's like a computer and it's energized by this idea of a soul, which is just a ball of energy. Yeah. And when your computer dies, your energy has to go somewhere. So it just kind of leaves. And I think the idea of hell and heaven is if you die in a happy place, your energy is positive and it goes to heaven and it's this positive thing that's reinforced in the world. And if you die in a sad, angry place, then it's hell and you, your energy has just left you in this very angry, stagnant. Forever. Yeah, forever. Because that's the energy that you left with. Yeah. So if, if you leave with that energy, I think that's why it's really important to like understand and accept death. And Yeah. And die in a peaceful way. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Hmm. I don't know. I got. I don't. I don't know that. I got much else hmm. in me. I don't know. I don't know. This is a nice talk. Yeah. I always like talking to you. <laughs> I know. I was. I was like a little nervous, but I was like, eh, I like talking to you, Danny. It's fine. So, where can people find you? Oh. People can find us on Facebook and Instagram, Rough and Tumble Dog Salon CT, or uh, follow us on Facebook, Rough and Tumble Dog Salon. Um, yeah, check us out. We have furrier information videos monthly that'll help you with care and maintenance of your dog and uh, frequently asked questions. Our website's very informational as well. Um, yeah, so if anybody you know or you are looking for a dog groomer, yeah. She's great. I bring my dog there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty cool spot. I don't do it alone. It's my whole team. Yeah. I do a great job. So, well, thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks for having me. Anytime. You're <laughs> always welcome here. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>